everybody. Welcome back to the show. This is the Banned Books Podcast, episode searching for a number. 68. Episode 68. As always, we are your somewhat confused hosts, Christopher Gillespie. Hey, everybody. Oh, wait, Matt, that's your line. That's my line. And I am Donovan Riley. <laughs> this week, we're going to jump back into uh, Robert Farrar Capen. And uh, we haven't done him in over a year, so we thought we would go back to him. We will uh, link in the show notes to the series that we did on Capen, the book Astonished at Heart. Correct. Which was something like essentially 12 episodes, maybe? Something like that, yeah. Yeah, it was like the, basically um, Capen's history of the Christian church post-Jesus. <laughs> right, exactly. Really good stuff. Mm -hmm. That was a fun conversation. It was. So we thought we'd dive back in. This is actually one of my favorites of Capon's. It's the book, The Mystery of Christ and Why We Don't Get It. We've talked a lot about mystery the last couple episodes. Yeah, we have, I guess, with the early church stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And referring to sacrament and its cognate That's mystery. That's true. That's true. Yeah. And, and the problem is, even with incarnation, it, it's really... Um, it's hard to get your head around <laughs> the yeah, idea it is. that it, Jesus is God and man in one person. Yeah, and, you know, to that point, and we'll dive into actually chapter six, the mystery and the incarnation, he's going to write about this. Since the enlightenment, let's say, just for a place to hang our historical hat on, rationalism as a movement objectified knowledge. Mm -hmm. And out of that, you had a counter movement, romanticism, which objectified experience and emotion, the heart. And within all of that, you have the rise of the scientific method. And it went from a philosophy to a discipline. And the church adopted the scientific method in one way, shape, or form, whether implicitly or explicitly. And you see this then in the interpretation of the Bible, let's say. And the Bible is being treated as a, a textbook in a scientific way. Mm. And rationalism really focuses hard on the material world. Yeah. And what our five senses can grasp. And as a consequence, mystery really has no place within rationalism. No. And we're not just talking about like using Genesis as a science textbook, but but mm -hmm. even using like say the New Testament as uh, like a moral text, right? Right, yeah. It's a proof text for the Christian life. Right. Are right. you living like Jesus taught or are you living the way of... Peter, Paul, Mary, Joseph, are you, are you walking the walk? And here's, here are these three, seven, 12. <laughs> the five you know, pillars. As right. Taught, yeah. And you see this in the early church, you see this in the middle ages, you see this in the reformation, but it's, what do you want to say? It's anachronistic. Mm. It's not as widespread as it, as it is post enlightenment in modernity. And as we've covered too, a lot of revival movements that come from these these eras, they do focus heavily on behavior modification. Yeah. And the external demonstration of something that's happening internally. Hmm. Like I talked about before, the conscience post-enlightenment is the angel and the devil on your shoulders. That's not a pre-enlightenment reformation or even early church teaching. That's a post-enlightenment teaching. Wow. Yeah. And so we go from what is my relation to God to what is my relation to myself? And then how do I measure that? It makes me think of uh, the temptation of Jesus by, by the devil himself and the way that mm -hmm. the devil uses God's word, um, tries to use it against him. And that's exactly right. what he does. Is It's not, I think especially it's the third temptation where um, Jesus, you know, is being tempted to live apart from his father, God the father. Mm -hmm. Right. right, and it's with the whole angels bit, right, and being mm -hmm. bearing, you know, he's going to command his angels to bear you up. Right. Like, why would I tempt my father in that way? Right. You know, and the idea that like we can, you can use the word to justify uh, basically what you want to be. Right. Well, and notice the three temptations are all material benefits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, kingdoms and what? bread and mm -hmm. safety. Yeah. Essentially, you want to be well fed. You want to be safe. And do you want the world as your oyster? Yeah, it's very simple. So the point being is that this, uh, this, it really is the the way that we, well, maybe even from the beginning, are tempted to take God's word and then uh, twist it basically for our own purpose. You know, whatever sure, that might absolutely. be, what that looks like. Well, material benefits by and large, mm -hmm. because notice Adam and Eve, the man and woman, look at each other's bodies and then they're ashamed. Mm. And you'll notice the fight between the religious leaders and Jesus is always the fight of 
material benefit versus big S spiritual benefits mm. and confusing the two kingdoms in that way. Yeah, like the Sabbath and the ox in the well, you know, or in, right. the, in, the, in the pit. Or like when I lived in East Louisiana in Shreveport and we would, or we would work in, I'm sorry, I lived in West Louisiana in Shreveport, Monroe, and we would work in East Texas. And the guy with the Cadillac that had a bumper sticker said, Jesus bought my Cadillac. Uh, okay. Right, right. <laughs> it's like, well, maybe. <laughs> but, you know, you know what, what, do you really want to put the, the whole of your faith on that statement? Yeah, because what happens when, uh, you know, the engine gets busted. <laughs> right. And I think too, to the point then, I think we actually loathe mystery mm. unless it provides some material benefit for, fit mm -hmm. for us in yeah. the present tense. Yeah, that was the angle I was trying to go at with that. Yeah. yeah. And so that's why I thought we could dive back into Capon on this because he's so infuriating to those who want to think this way. <laughs> because really what we're talking about then and what Capon will get at in this chapter is it's a transactional theology or to put it simply, it's Santa Claus theology. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good Christians get good things and bad Christians go to hell. Well, doesn't it just kind of rub us the wrong way if there's something that is to be confessed, to be believed, mm -hmm. but that we can't quite get our heads around why? Especially right. when it happens to someone that we have already judged to be unworthy or undeserving of God's, you know, grace, the benefits of, of God's grace, the, re the material rewards. Yeah. How dare you forgive her or how dare he have that? So forth and so on. Oh, but we think forgiveness is kind of cut and dry, easy to kind of parse out and figure out where it's deserved, where it's not. And that's right. But that's not what the scriptures give. No, no, it's messy. Forgive your enemies? Uh, what? <laughs> right. So you're saying that if I forgive them, I'm pouring hot coals of judgment on their head? How does that work in the present tense then? Because if I forgive them and they laugh at me or they mock me, uh -huh. I don't really, I don't really see the judgment part of this. <laughs> yeah. As if you could somehow control that word and make it do what you want it right, to do. Right, right. Mm. The word of God goes out and it does, and he does not return to him empty handed. Mm -mm. And then we go, okay, but let's see what's in your hand. <laughs> yeah. Or, or could sure. I just convince you to do it this way? Maybe? Right, right. Hmm. So let's dive into chapter six then, the mystery of Christ and why we don't get it by Robert Farrar Capon, the mystery and the incarnation. And this begins with a dialogue then between some people, Luis and, uh, or Louis, Robert and Frank. So Lewis, well, he certainly got himself worked up, didn't he? Do people often get that angry at your sermons? <laughs> <laughs> Robert, not too often, but then maybe preachers only hear from the more aggressive types. This is true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm pretty sure Dan was right when he claimed lots of other people shared his views. People are saying. Pastor, some people are saying. I'd even go so far as to say they are the silent majority of the church. Most of them will smile at least a little while, while you're up there preaching free grace and acceptance for everybody, because it really does sound like good news. But if you give them 20 minutes more to think about it, and to realize it lets in the riffraff of the world as well as them, <laughs> it stops sounding so good to them. And once they've figured it out, it means God has forgiven even Hitler. They begin to think about tarring and feathering the messenger who brought them such outrageous news. It's one of the occupational hazards of the preaching trade. Jesus annoyed the hell out of quite a few of his listeners. <laughs> That's so true. I love that line. I stole so much from Capon for my book. It's just, <sighs> this is the point is, we can't climb up into heaven and murder God a second time, but we can get a hold of his preachers mm -hmm. and annihilate them. He did say that was going to happen. He, he kind of warned us, yes. Yeah, that they're going to kill you thinking they're doing service to me. And this goes back to something I, I talked about in the last episode is, this is at root, I think, in my opinion, why 90% of sermons are about Christians and not about Christ. Because mm. whether you're aware of it or not as a preacher, when you get that pushback, even it's, if it's as benign as, pastor, some people are talking, or it's just in your face, don't you ever preach a sermon like that again, and here's the reason why. When you're writing that next sermon and you're prepping, that is in the back of your mind. Yeah. You're going to back off a little bit. Right. It's like, I got a paycheck to worry about. I got bills to pay. I got a, I got mouths to feed. I, I like my job here in this congregation, so forth and so on. I'm going to dial it back a little bit just right. for longevity's sake. <laughs> right. But as I, I noted, we're quick to try not to offend congregation members or visitors, but we haven't quite asked the question, well, but 
have we offended God then? Yeah, and um, since it is actually our purpose, our reason, what we've been sent to do, it becomes an offense to those who need to hear that message, right? Because they mm -hmm. show up thinking this is going to be the place where I'm going to hear what you know what we're trying to accomplish, like say you know through social movements right now, sure, you know, acceptance and tolerance, tolerance and, yeah. and and we actually don't do that at all. It's like you're either mm -hmm. with us or against us, kind of thing. Right. It's actually very intolerant, but <laughs> but we think we're creating this culture of of acceptance. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone is is welcome. That kind of idea. Um, and then somebody comes, you know, to the church expecting, you know, and, and they should expect to actually hear the, uh, that you have been accepted for Jesus' sake, right? Right. And then you failed to do that, to preach that. Right. Uh, yes, you've offended them. Um, maybe they don't see it that way, but definitely mm -hmm. offended God. Yeah. But it's an offense to those who are perishing. And that word perishing in Greek is a very graphic word. Mm -hmm. It means literally being ground into nothing, annihilated. It's, it's serious business. Yeah. Don't you care that we're perishing? Huh? Yeah. So back to Frank then. Frank says, still, I think Dan had a point. <laughs> you make it all sound so easy and light that people are going to get the idea. They don't have to make any response at all to grace. Haven't you ever considered that maybe you are preaching what Bonhoeffer called cheap grace? That maybe you are actually missing the meaning of the judgment passages in the Bible? Don't works count at all? The Epistle of James says, faith, if it hath not works, is dead. Good point. Good point, Dan, Frank. And then Robert says, Frank, I never said there's no response to be made to grace, just that faith, trust, is the only possible response. It's the only response, in fact, that Jesus and Paul insist on. Mm -hmm. And what's more, neither one of them is about to allow you to turn faith into a work. Not even if Bonhoeffer flirted with just that mistake, which I think he did. I think he was having an off day when he came up with the phrase cheap grace. <laughs> it's kind of like, uh, yeah, criticism of, say, Luther or something. Well, he only said that once. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> grace can't be cheap, Frank. It's free. All you have to do is believe it, nothing else. Mm. I happen to think Jesus meant it when he said his yoke is easy and his burden light. When his audience asked him what they should do to work the works of God, he said, this is the work of God, that you believe in the one whom he sent. Oh, that Gospel of John, if we could just get that out of the New Testament. Mm -hmm. So, so messy. He even went so far as to say, God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not judged. Let me repeat that. Mm -hmm. Those who believe in him are not judged. God simply does not count our works. He only asks us to trust the work that he has done for us in Jesus. If you're listening to this and you're struck by this, what mm -hmm. I suggest you do is buy two copies of this book. Yes. And with the first copy, go to page 79 and with an exacto knife, cut this paragraph out <laughs> and laminate it and then put it on your bathroom mirror or on the door to your office or wherever you need to to read it every single day because this is the argument of the bible mm -hmm. and of the church in every generation until the resurrection and that there's so much here that uh, the people argue against right? right and i'm saying for me this is the basis for every single sermon that i'll preach hmm. regardless of the text because at root believe in the son whom he sent yes. the son who who <laughs> Yes, um, is gracious towards you, but it was not cheap to him. Right, right, right. He gave his life uh, for right. you. Right. I mean, is that a cheap gift? <laughs> well, think of it this way: if you're uncomfortable with that, then let's add one sentence to the end. Mm. And if you're uncomfortable with the lack of preaching of works, just know that God predestined you to walk in good works that He laid out for you before the foundation of the world. Isn't the isn't the problem that like somebody would read, say, the Epistle of James alone? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Or, so they hear the word faith, and they don't read into faith the the apostles' teaching, not just James, but the rest of the Correct. apostles. What, right. what do they say about faith? Right. And, and just read it. If you read it alone, then you, yeah, you could turn faith into just the the highest good work. Right. Right. Well, but but pastor, what about the three theological virtues of faith, hope, and love? Hmm. Exactly. Jesus? That word virtue <laughs> is added after the fact to that text. Uh -huh. 
Which is a loaded phrase, yeah. Is a loaded phrase because now we're back to ethics and we're back to discussions of behavior and and action. And yes, faith is an action. It's an action of the Holy Spirit. And works are an action, but they're an action of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Because you are dead in your trespasses and therefore you need some person from outside of you to come along and raise you from the dead if you're going to have faith and perform works. I know he's going to get to it. Uh, if I remember correctly, or if I mm-hmm. if I know Capen well enough, <laughs> yes, <laughs> that uh, the reason why we want to hmm, emphasize works is that we can quantify, we can evaluate mm, exactly. So, yeah, so you can look yourself. You know, you can be very self critical that way and say, well, do I really believe enough? Do I haven't? Right. You know, have I been faithful enough? Do I trust him as much as I as I should? And where are the signs of my faithfulness? Where are the mm-hmm. signs mm-hmm. of my work? Mm-hmm. Hence, James. The Epistle of James, but right. but also it's not just us; it's others too. I mean, pastors mm-hmm. have this, you know, kind of. <laughs> it's a recipe for despair if you start looking at the people you've been given to minister to. Look at their works right. as right. evidence of faithfulness. To say, "Wow, this congregation is so faithful." Um, actually, well, and I think at root, <laughs> it has nothing to do with works. Actually, it has to do with judgment. Well, right, and that's what he's getting at. Not right. only we want to know that we're going to escape the hellfire of judgment, mm-hmm. and we also, you know, well, maybe. We can escape if they if they take our place, right? The people right. around us. Right. I don't care where I sit on the bus that's going to take me to the resurrection so long as I'm on the bus. <laughs> it's like that meme of uh, fight like you're the third monkey trying to get on the ark and it's starting to rain. Yeah. It's like there's only two of us getting on this ark. You made me think of the, uh, the bus to hell that's on the preacher show. <laughs> The magic school bus, the Christian edition. Yeah, except it's it's the it's just it's on fire and it's, it's yeah. on the way to hell. And amazingly, you can derail the bus to hell. That's right. That's a show, it's, though. By the way, seems it's like fiction. it should be a cover for a meatloaf album. <laughs> the school bus to hell. Yeah, the school bus to hell. <laughs> so back to Frank. Now, I still think you're giving us a fast shuffle. I want to hear you say something serious about judgment. There you go. Fire and brimstone, Robert. Yeah. Robert, you will, Frank, you will, but not before I've set the subject in what I think is its serious New Testament context. Mm. Bear with me for a bit. I promise I'll give you plenty on judgment before I'm through. For openers, the first thing I want to do is nail down the right connection between the mystery of Christ and the incarnation. If you recall, I preached the sermon Dan objected to during the Christmas season, and I gave it the title, The Incarnation, as the gift of universal acceptance in Christ. That's important here because there are two different ways you can come at the incarnation. One is to turn it into a transaction that was poked into the history of the world at a specific time and place, namely in the person and work of Jesus. The other is to model it as a feature of the constitution of the universe, a mystery present in creation from beginning to end but which was finally and fully manifested to us in Jesus. Uh, wow. <laughs> yeah, that's thick. I, that's a meaty I paragraph. Think, I think that that distinction, wow, it's a pretty helpful diagnosis um, to the way that we, and we've talked a lot about transactional thinking with God, right? right. But even viewing Christ coming in the flesh as a transaction, the promise mm-hmm. of the incarnation, say in Genesis, this, right. this, this is like, a, what do we, I think we've called it like a divine do-over, Right, right. Yeah, God yeah. made this mistake. Yeah, and, it's a mulligan. Yeah, and so then he's gonna he's gonna make it right. Right. Hmm. Yeah, I did this. Now what are you gonna do? Hmm. Hmm. I sacrificed my son for your sake. Now what are you gonna do in return? What are you gonna do to say thank you? You better say thank you, or you're gonna help. Right. Or you made this mistake, so I'm gonna have to do this to fix it. Right. And the thing is, every atheist ever recognizes the internal hypocrisy <laughs> of that statement. God loves you, but if you don't love him back, he's gonna send you to hell. Or God loves you, but if you don't go to that building down the street on Sunday and put your money in the plate, he hates you. Mm. That's mm. a crude version of it, but yeah, an atheist yeah. often mm. has the objectivity to strip down the sermon, uh, strip away the platitudes and the trite cliches and go, actually, this is what you're saying. Yeah. We're pretty good at disguising it. Mm, well, yeah. We dress it up in pageantry. Right. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> pageantry. But even even just nice words, you know, mm-hmm. add churchy words. To kind of ignore the fact that no, what you're what you're asking or what you're asking of me is basically what every church is asking of me or every faith, right? And as we've discussed plenty of times, at root, what you're saying as a preacher, at least, is I don't believe that the word of God actually has any power. Hmm. 
So I've got to give it power. But the problem is I'm a material being, I'm flesh and blood. And the only thing that I can point to then is material things. You people in the pews that are flesh and blood, but also the things of your life. Or even home. even the preacher pointing to himself. Right, you know, His rhetoric, his skill, his appearance, right. whatever it is. Yeah. Right, like, and like we said, you strip all the mystery of the incarnation away and you're just left with these raw materials. And then the question becomes for the preacher, what are you going to do with these raw materials? Yeah, you have to use them like you're the, you're not the creator of the tool, but you're the a wielder right. of. And then the statement, the word of God goes out and doesn't return to him empty handed becomes now the preacher goes out and he must not return to God empty handed. And he then preaches that to Christians mm -hmm. that the word of goes out and you better not return to him empty handed. Yeah, or like the parable of the sower. I mean, you've got this seed, you better go out and sow it right. in yeah. four different ways. Right. I'm like, that grow, makes a baby, lot grow. of sense. <laughs> yeah. Because the parable actually doesn't allow for the idea that you that you get to pick where the seed goes. Right. At all. Yeah, that's a terrible parable when you drill down into it and go, well, wait a minute. What kind of a sower just throws seed everywhere and lets some die? Not me. How dare you? Jesus, Yeah, maybe. not me. <laughs> That's right. I've got straight rows. I've measured. I have a ruler out there, so I know the exact dig, you know, depth that I got to plant these seeds. I'm there every day. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, no. So let's talk about the transactional view first. Maybe the best way to show what's wrong with it is a model or as a model of the incarnation is to work it up in terms of a football game. Look at what you get if you do that. Since you believe as a Christian that the God of the Old Testament is none other, none other than the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but since the incarnation as such is not mentioned in the Old Testament, you start out by saying that God the Father is the only person of the Trinity involved in the game of history during the first half. This is called modalism. We, we actually talked about this before. We have, yeah. God the Son, the person who became incarnated Jesus, simply wasn't on the field at all, meaning he wasn't in the Old Testament. He's not there. You can't find him. And not only that, but the Father is involved principally as a coach. Sending in players and plays from the heavenly sidelines. Patriarchs, prophets. Yeah. Psalmist. Kind of Still, playing, even just playing around. He's just teasing you. Right. Exactly. That's right. Still, even at that distance, he runs up an impressive, if not decisive, score. From the coin toss in Genesis 1 until just before the angel Gabriel appears to Mary, he has things pretty well under control. But then during halftime, he decides to try a new strategy. He decides it's time to get deity itself into the game. So without ceasing to be the coach, the father sends the second person of the Trinity, the word who is God, into the game as a new quarterback, who will be both divine and human at the same time. In other words, God becomes present in the game in a way he previously hadn't been. This works like a charm, of course. The third quarter of the game is an absolute rout. The opposition, while it's not knocked out of the game completely, is so heavily scored against that for all practical purposes, it hasn't got the chances of a snowball in a stew pot. <laughs> but then at the beginning of the fourth quarter, God the Father decides on the final winning strategy. He pulls the divine human quarterback out of the game at the ascension of Christ. Mm -hmm. And he sends in God the Holy Spirit at Pentecost to empower and inspire his team all the way up to the final tick of the clock. <laughs> now then, there are two things that are halfway decent about this football game model. Let's acknowledge that first. Yes. Right. It does score, correspond nicely to the progressive, quote, in the course of history, way that God actually revealed the incarnation to the world. And it gives, it does give you not only a rousing victory at the end of the game, but also the impression that the victory was in the bag from the start, since God, as one or another of the persons of the Trinity, was involved in it all along. Okay. But, yeah. <laughs> Okay, that's nice. But from the New Testament point of view, the model turns out to be a Model T, a heap. Because the New Testament says in a number of places that the mystery of Christ, which is nothing other than the incarnation of God in history, was active in the game from start to finish, not just in the third quarter or in the third and fourth. If you say the Holy Spirit somehow managed to make the ascended quarterback present during the last 15 minutes of the game, for just a single instance of that New Testament view, look at the text for the sermon Dan got himself all worked up about. Ephesians 1 verse 4 says that God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, before the game even started. So this is the thing too. 
Mm -hmm. is that we want to divide between the material and the spiritual. Mm -hmm. But unlike all of the other religions, Judaism, Christianity, is in the incarnation of Christ proves this to be true, is that God embraces all of what we call spiritual while simultaneously embracing all of what we call material. That God is with his people in the middle of the camp. He's not on right. Mount Olympus. He's not at the edge of the universe. He's camping out with us, which is both problematic in a law sort of way and yet deeply comforting in a gospel sort of way. Well, and I don't know that we read the text all that well when it comes to, you know, reading the first half of history, <laughs> so to speak. Right. No, absolutely. We read prophecies about Christ. It's like, wait a minute, who's leading the armies of Israel? Exactly. The Lord of hosts, which in Hebrew well, means... But what did he look like? Lord of armies. Yeah, what did he look like? Uh, Jesus. No one has seen the Father except the Son who has made him manifest to us. Mm-hmm. No. Yeah, and this I, is the problem, is that if you read the Old Testament as just prophecies about Christ, you completely miss the word of God present in history. Yeah, it seems like, oh, what do you want to say? That God is, he's just biding his time. He's kind sure. of, he's kind of, you know, absent father, right? Yeah. He's on a road trip. It's a torturous theology, though. It is. Because it's it, it does make it look like, you know, especially when the people are, are moving, God's people are moving away from faithfulness. Right, that he's somehow like allowing that to happen to them, what mm -hmm. in, a, in a kind of an a, a distant or just babble, like babble. God yeah. saw what they were doing, and then he came down and said, "Let's let's mess with this." Yeah, and we talked about that in the last episode. You know, being more like Zeus, right? And right, just most of the time he's he's pretty benign. It's just mm -hmm. when he gets kind of worked up and he starts throwing firebolts at you. Yeah. But notice then this distinction holds true, I believe, for our exegesis of the Old Testament. God hides Himself. And that's when his people go, where are you? They cry mm -hmm. out, where are yeah. you? What have we done to deserve this? And yet when God speaks, his word, the second person of the Trinity, the son, is the one who speaks. So that, he, one, he assures them, I've been with you the whole time, and I'm faithful, I'm loving, I'm kind, even when you're not. I will keep to my promise that I made to your fathers. And yet, because you've chosen this path, because you've chosen to worship right. these gods, these are the consequences that you brought upon yourself, by the way. Yeah, initially... Uh well, what, what's really astounding is like when they're in exile in, say, Babylon, you've got Daniel and the three young men, and and they, they yes, they pray towards Jerusalem. Right. You know, they'd like to go home, and yet they don't seem to think that God has forgotten them or left them alone. They still pray. They still believe. Here's the trick, right, is that, or twist, however you want to say it, is that God actually never judges anyone, but rather says, oh, that's what you crave? That's what you want? Fine, have it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then we cry out, why have you done this to us? I simply gave you what you desired. Now, this is the twist. That's actually unconditional love. To give them over God, to what they desire? Right, that God actually allows himself to be rejected by us and says, oh, you prefer that to me? Well, good luck with that. And I'll be waiting for you when you cry out and say, wait, we don't want this anymore. This is bad. We didn't realize how what a terrible mistake we made. And guess what? He's there. Yeah, like the prodigal, right? The father gives him his inheritance. Like, that's a really dumb thing to ask. Yeah. We assume that God <laughs> abandons us. Yes, that God abandons us to judgment and then comes back later and says, have you learned your lesson? Versus, I love you so much that I'm going to give you what you want. Mm. Which mm. is terrifying. And I'm going to be as with said, you in that too. Exactly, yeah. I will be with you in that suffering. And as I said, what does God's judgment feel like? It feels like free will. Mm -hmm. He gives you what you desire most. And we see this over and over, especially in the prophets, yeah. of God calling his people back, saying, repent. And this is key maybe to repentance then, a proper understanding of repentance is God is simply saying, listen, you don't want that. Come mm. back. Mm -hmm. Come back to me now. Turn back before it's too late. But if you insist on a king, I'll give you a king that you deserve. Sure thing. <laughs> if you insist on worshiping other gods, I will give you the gods you deserve. And as he says in the prophet, you worship nothing and you're going to become nothing. And the people say, I'm good with that. Yeah. God tempts no one, <laughs> as Luther right. reminds us. Exactly. So it's right there in front of us the whole time in simple language. It doesn't take mental or exegetical gymnastics to arrive at these conclusions. Just read the text. I think the reason why we maybe abstract God from the story of the Old Testament is that we want to probably do the same in the New Testament church, in our in our own um, life, 
right? 100%. That, is right. that he's, he's abstracted from us because if he's really close, <laughs> right. that's almost too close for comfort. Right. It's like I said, if he's in the middle of the camp and I don't want him around right now because I'm going to go over here and do this stuff that I know he's not cool with, I'd prefer he not be present. On the other hand, if I'm suffering, I, I love the fact that he's in the middle of the camp because I can go right to him and say, hey, I'm suffering. What's the deal? The, the example is, you know, when uh, in the congregation, the behavior of the mm -hmm. congregation towards one another before and after the service is <laughs> right? markedly different than it is from the invocation to the benediction. Right. And like, um, you recognize that the invocation is declaring what's already actually true. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you already are together in Christ. He is present amongst you before I said any of those words. Right. And that's that's really then at the root of judgment, isn't it? Is that... Mm. I know I'm a hypocrite in my heart. I can't, I can't lie to the person in the mirror. However, maybe if I can shift blame onto you, God will overlook my hypocrisy because you're hypo like, I'm a C plus hypocrite, mm. but from what I've seen of you, you're a B plus hypocrite at, at worst. You're more like an A minus hypocrite most yeah. days. Thank you. So exactly. So maybe if I can just go, well, I know I'm bad God, but I'm not as bad as Gillespie. Mm. Then at the judgment, he'll avoid me. Yeah, because you'll have but bigger still, problems. Right, exactly. There's like, worse people to deal with. Right. I mean, 144,000 is 144,000. Come on, let's go. Not a very big number, but... No, considering the trillions of people that have lived. Wow. Back to the text. That means not only that the triumphant outcome of the game of history was never in doubt, but that everyone was chosen to enjoy it. It means, in short, that the victory at the end was fully present to everyone from the beginning. There you go. Mm -hmm. This is why, incidentally, you can't expound the good news of the Incarnation without doing at least some justice to the ideas of election, which simply means God chooses you in Christ. Mm -hmm. By God and destination, or predestination, by God. Let me point this out, too, because this is a question that comes up often enough for us it as does. Lutherans, yeah. Calvinists. Is, number one, election means God chooses you in Christ. Where does that happen at? The cross. Number two, predestination doesn't refer to you. It refers to God determining his destination before the foundation of the world. The, pre, course, the course of all events. Yeah. Exactly. Is that God has determined that his destination is you. Mm -hmm. Well, how do I know this? Well, one from Romans, because he says this in Romans chapter eight. And number two, the cross. Or maybe number one, the cross. And then two, Paul flushes that out in Romans chapter Especially eight. Especially see that in the evangelists where uh, everything and, and depending on which evangelist, there's different hints. Right. Everything is is steering towards the cross. My time has not yet come. My time is not yet come. Right. Well, what time are you talking about? The cross, right? Right. right. Mm -hmm. Well, what about faith then? You were pre Again, he chose you in Christ before the foundation of the world. Well, what about works? He predestined you to walk in these good works before the foundation of the world. Next question. Does that make you a robot though? I mean, I think that's usually the accusation that we right. hear. Only if you think you don't have a choice. And you do. You do have a choice, and that choice is to reject God. <laughs> yeah, like you said, free will is what? Yeah. The judgment of God. Yeah. Oh, do you want freedom? Your kind of freedom? Okay, great. Go be a slave. Enjoy that. Yeah, and that is the story of, of the Old Testament, that first half of the football game, mm -hmm. right? Right. Is that right. Uh, God's people continue to choose slavery over freedom in him. Right. Yeah. So you do have freedom, and your freedom is you're going to muck this up. Can we go back to Egypt? Because at least we had like kind of onions. Yeah. On meat pots. Like, yeah, we that. had meat pots. I don't know what those like, are, but it sounds pretty pockets. awesome. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. There's always stew on the oven. So it was, yes. we don't know what the meat, it was mystery meat, but right. you know. <laughs> I would actually say, in my own experience, pastorally speaking and as a lady, mm -hmm. that the people that are troubled by the language of election and predestination are those who have not heard the gospel mm. or at least reject it and don't believe it. But mm. those who are connected to and love the language of election and predestination, like in Luther's Bondage of the Will, his mm -hmm. debate with Erasmus, they not only hunger and thirst for that righteousness that only is Christ, but also then having heard it, they cling to it and say, yeah. give me more. Turn the fire hose all the way up to 11. You can't hear all. enough of right. the fact that God chose you from, you know, from the beginning. Right. He, he, I say it this way. He created you to redeem you. Right. Like, what? <laughs> well, yeah. He wants you to yeah. be his own. That's that was the right. whole that's the whole point. Not that and you this is, can exist apart from him. 
and I, I would argue this is truly the offense of the gospel, mm. is that God says, I choose you, but I'm not worthy. I know. That's why I choose you. Mm. We do well, not what choose. What about him? <laughs> I choose him too, but he's not worthy. I know. That's why I chose him. Mm -hmm. Again, tax collector and Pharisee, prodigal son. This is the danger of the parables. Yeah, somebody's going to get off the hook. Theological dynamite. Yeah, mm -hmm. unjust steward. Mm -hmm. So back to the book, those ideas alone get across the truth that it is God's efforts alone that win the game, not the player's efforts to obey the divine coach or the divine quarterback. By the way, in the Lutheran tradition, and we're all about the hmm. solas, Christ alone, grace alone, faith mm -hmm. alone, scripture alone, we don't actually in practice hold to those because that, that aloneness really bothers us old Adams. Yeah, it disqualifies the individual, it disqualifies the preacher. Right. right. There's really no game at all, no. actually. <laughs> right, exactly. And, and that's the point is, it's good to know the rules of the game and it's great to win the game, but it's best to not play it at all, mm. to quote Mark Manson. <laughs> so the doctrine of election reminds you that the works of the players in history are not the key to the success of history under God. And the doctrine of predestination, provided you stay a million miles away from the idea that God predestines some people to damnation, guarantees that it's his grace and not our merit that's the effective operative ingredient in the game. So what about all the other players? What about you then? If, right. If, if it's all God, mm -hmm. then well, what about me? Right. When you show up at the stadium, he just hands you the Super Bowl trophy. You win. <laughs> <laughs> what right it's like i was um to use this analogy because i was listening to someone discuss this the other day in relation to my area of life mm -hmm. when you win the super bowl that's one day in one place once a year so the patriots win the super bowl they're the super bowl champions but the next day they're zero and zero yep they, start have over. To win, they have to start all over again when you're the middleweight ufc champion of the world every single fight you are fighting for the UFC middleweight championship until you lose it. So that means that you're always the champion or not. Therefore, every single time you fight, everything's on the line. You're not working up to it, you're it. And I say the same thing then that to use that analogy, it's not like you hear the gospel on Sunday, but then on Monday you're zero and zero and there's 16 games in the season, so to speak, mm -hmm, or six games in the mm -hmm, season and then mm -hmm. Sunday. But rather every single day, as a baptized child of God, you're the champion. And the upside of this is every single fight then against sin, death, and the devil is a fight for the ultimate stakes. But so mm -hmm. long as you're a baptized child of God, so long as God's um, grace, his, his delight for you in Christ remains, and it does unequivocally, you win. You don't have to get in the octagon. You don't have to fight you win right and even as we do quote unquote battle with send death right. and devil right. um it's almost it's almost more playful than it is um, right you know like i mean the stakes of I mean, the, the battle's already won i mean you can mm -hmm. you can actually confront your sin or right. or whether sin is manifest in you you can mm -hmm. confront that without worry that oh i'm going to uncover some demon that's going to overcome me right right well, go back to your your point about god being the god of hosts or the god of armies and going in front of his people mm -hmm. when paul says in ephesians again put on the armor of god notice that all of the armor is provided for you by god because it's faith grace so forth mm -hmm. and so on and yet just because you're dressed for battle that doesn't mean that god goes okay i'll, I'll be in the rear and here's the tactics that I want you to carry out for me today. And mm -hmm. if you do it perfectly, mm -hmm. you'll win the battle. No, he doesn't say that. He's in front rather, of you. He's, he's around in you. front he's of on you. you. Exactly. Yeah. So we're going to march to war, but like Joshua's army at Jericho, the outcome of this battle, this outcome of this war is already predetermined. Mm. Period. And the only way, the only way that things can go wrong is if you break ranks and run. I kind of like how, I can't remember what him it is, but it says that like the devil's power is a, is a joke or a, just a mere facade. Right. You know? Yeah. And, then, and then also the way the scriptures say that, uh, that the word of God, you know, quenches the flaming darts, you know, mm -hmm. uh, of the devil. And you right. say, well, what is that? Oh, you know what that means? It means that the devil's going to keep throwing arrows at you and they're right. just not going to, they're not going to hit you because they're absorbed in the son of God who's, who, who is yours. Yeah, and I don't, I don't know if, I talked about that in a Christ Old Fast Wednesday morning devotion on the Psalms, that 
that's in, in one of the Psalms that I talked about, and I can't remember off the top of my head if it's Psalm 24 or where, but mm. is that it? he says directly that the arrows, you know, the arrows of the wicked will pierce you. And you'll be like, and it's like thousands of arrows. It's it's a wow. it's like that scene in Three Hundred at the end when the mm-hmm. arrows blot out the sky. And yet, Christ specifically says that I am the shield that absorbs all those arrows, so that you're not struck. Yeah, they will pierce That's, you, as in Jesus. As in Jesus, yes, exactly. Mm. So if you say, "Well, how is that possible?" Because don't I die from those arrows? Well, look at the cross. He you're died your death for him. you. Yeah, exactly. So not even your dying is your death. It's his. <laughs> That's why you can say it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. <laughs> yeah, it's beautiful. Um, but I, I think, you know, you and I, we're right now confessing what is really a mystery. Right. It's like, no, it a is minute. a mystery because yeah. it it hurts. Yeah. It's painful. Nowhere in the Bible does God say, I'm going to remove your pain. Mm-hmm. I wrote an article about this for 1517. Nowhere does God say, I'm going to take away your pain. Actually, he says, I'm going to increase it on account of what you just did. Well, and the but, increase of pain here is that you can't actually take responsibility for your actions. Exactly. In a, in a, at least before God, right? Exactly. Hmm. He's going to take thus, responsibility for your actions in your place. Right. So pain is essentially, to kind of turn the phrase, in, in, in my, my ecosystem, pain is just weakness leaving the body. <laughs> but to turn that then, what pain is, is Christ working out your salvation in and through you. And sin saying, no. And the spirit saying, you don't get a vote. Hmm. And that's just the flesh. That's all the pain is. It's just the flesh saying, I don't want this. And and the gospel and the Holy Spirit saying, well, you're going to get it anyways. Yeah. And it's not some kind of mental game that you're playing. No. Where, where, where you're saying, oh, the pain is good or something like that. It's like, it no, is. you're, no. It's a mystery though. The, yeah. The, it is good because it is you, it is your flesh being put to death as Paul talks about in Romans. And that, that it is good. In Christ, that pain is good. Right. So faith but says- a, Right. Faith says good, mm-hmm. but the old Adam says, this is fa- this is futile. That's what breeds fatalism or nihilism mm-hmm. or radical humanism even of, like today we talked about before we went on air, pain equals bad. Monolithically, pain is bad. Therefore, if I'm in pain, whether it's you said something that causes me pain or I do something that causes me pain or someone, whatever it might be, bad, bad person, bad thing versus no, pain is not monolithic. Hmm. There, there's good kind of pain go work out yeah and, so and go fire that that you know purifies sometimes. right yeah but it is it's not one or the other and like you said it's not a mental trick hmm. but rather holding to that mystery so and, back to the book yeah. accordingly it's time to junk <laughs> it's time to junk the transactional football game model and hunt for a better one one that will do justice to the incarnation as a fact of the universe from the beginning rather than as a patch job, tucked in as an afterthought at some point halfway through history. That's why in my sermon, I suggested three further models of how the incarnation, quote unquote, gets to us. The yearbook, the ticket window, and the stadium open to all for free. But that's also why I eventually threw out the first two and settled on the last one. Hmm. Look for a minute at what's wrong with the yearbook model. It falls flat on its axles in the garage, and doesn't deliver the incarnation to us at all. All it delivers is our own remembrance of the incarnation, which is no more a real presence of the word incarnate in Jesus than my remembrance of John F. Kennedy is a real presence of John F. Kennedy. (laughs) Which, by the way, is why the Lord's Supper isn't a remembrance of Jesus' Last Supper. Because what good is that? Exactly. Well, it's as good as remembering John F. Kennedy. (laughs) Nice guy. Well, same thing for the gospel. Past tense gospel means you're not hearing the gospel. Mm Mm-mm. The gospel's present tense always for you. Mm -hmm. More than that, its insistence on human remembering is the operative device. Well, it leaves me strictly on my own as far as getting a grip on the work of Jesus is concerned. Exactly. Yeah. You must believe. Yes. Hmm. So again, if we talk about communion, your belief that the bread and wine are the body and blood of Jesus is what makes it real Hmm. in this scenario, which is horrifying. (laughs) Yeah, because mystery. And so good luck with that. And then, and number two, I don't always believe it is. What? You can't say that, Mr. Pastor. I know. Because it's con- <laughs> it's really present is also conditional on the pastor believing it's really present for some. Right. And that's even more terrifying then because it's completely out of your control. Yep. 
It does not say, as the New Testament does, that Jesus has already done a a terrific job on me. The most it can say is that if I get myself sufficiently inspired by the memory of Jesus, I may be able to do a terrific job on myself. Which, if it is not an outright lie, mere remembrance of good examples has never yet succeeded as a way of getting the world's mess straightened up is at least one of the most sweeping overstatements of all time. If remembrance works at all, it works only for some people in some instances. Most of us, most of the time, go right on being messes. Hmm. Again, that's just a golden paragraph. It's like I have friends who are veterans, and they've really instilled this in me as well, is that there are millions of people in graveyards who would trade places with me in a second. Yeah regardless of my woe is me victimhood mentality just to live just to live so therefore live life in gratitude for their sacrifice live life for them if for nothing else the point is though i can't do that every second of every day Mm -mm. because i'm just human i get distracted i have to think about other things i can't be thinking about dead soldiers every day i can't be thinking about the apostles and the saints every day I can't live according to the model set out in the Psalms every moment of every day. I just can't. You could if you abandoned everyone and everything around you. Right. True. But then I'd be thinking about that all the time. <laughs> what you left behind. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's like they 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 were selfless. They took the hit for me. And now I'm being selfish <laughs> and separating myself from these people so that I can only think about their memory, which is going to constantly remind me and judge me for being so damn selfish yeah. on account of their selflessness. Yeah. Comes back to at you either way. Yeah. It's a, it's the snake eating its own tail. Mm-hmm. And thus the whole point of if your belief in the Lord's Supper or your belief in what Jesus did in the past or your belief in your works is the operative thing that makes you a Christian, you're doomed. This is the whole point of of penance and indulgences. You can't work your relatives out of purgatory without getting yourself thrown into purgatory. Mm. Because the whole time you're working them out, you're not working yourself into heaven. Yeah. Or you're like spending your own merit for their right. sake, which right. leaves you with little to none. Right. I was going to say, it's a constantly increasing deficit. Mm-hmm. It's Sisyphus pushing the rock up the hill. You yeah. can't win. The game is rigged. It's like 18 years of childbearing does for your sleep. <laughs> right yeah that's right we weren't always stupid you made us this way primarily <laughs> through sleep deprivation why do you yawn all the time you <laughs> right <laughs> yeah you <laughs> that's pretty much it that's right every yawn is youth just exiting my body <laughs> so back to the book next look at the ticket window model with its casting of jesus as the official ticket seller it starts off well enough at least it says that the incarnation is actually present somewhere that Jesus is really there for the customers who show up at the window, and that once they've bought tickets from him, their presence in the stadium is a sure thing. But then it begins to develop transactional engine trouble. Hmm. First, it says that only those who show up at the window actually get tickets. Thus, deep sixing Jesus' promise, I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all to me. John 12, verse 32. But second, it says that even showing up at the window doesn't guarantee them a ticket. They have to buy one, either with the hard cash of good works or with some kind of credit card that theologians might rig (laughs) up for them, maybe by saying that God, when he comes across people with an invincibly ignorant lack of good works, just extends their credit limit, which is what we were just talking about, Mm -hmm. or decides that he'll take American Express after all. But that is all hopeless. The cash-in-hand version violates the New Testament principle of salvation gratis of our seat in the stadium as a free gift that needs only to be believed, not earned. And the credit card version substitutes a lot of computer fiction for the truth that God actually makes us good, that is righteous, in Jesus. Mm. Listen to Paul on the subject. In Romans 3, verses 21 through 26. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. 
since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are now justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by His blood, effective through faith. He did this to show His righteousness, because in His divine forbearance, He had passed over the sins previously committed. It was to prove at the present time that He Himself is righteous, and that He justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. Good. Yeah, exactly. Amen. I, I'm re- reminded of uh, actually a couple of quotes from uh, one of our favorite teachers, uh, Norman Nagel. Right. Uh, one was at Marburg. Uh, he quotes Luther and he summarizes Luther this way, no more mathematics. Mm-hmm. You know, this whole like transactional game with, with God, like one, I do this right. and you do that and then together that's salvation. Right. It's kind of like showing up at the ticket window uh-huh. to use the analogy and saying, well, how much is a ticket? Well, $2. Well, you have well, to have I've the ticket got... to get in. Right. You got to get the ticket. And I've only got a buck fifty. Well, I tell you what, I'm going to let you in, but then you stay afterwards and clean the floor. So there's some kind of like computational yes. you know, process that happens. My merit plus your grace equals my sal- salvation. Exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I'm reminded of that. I'm also, uh, I got to think of what the other one was. Oh, yes. You know, when we evaluate, um, you know, you can evaluate your preacher's word this way. You can actually just read God's word this way. It's to say, who's the subject? And mm-hmm. then, uh, consequently, who's the one doing the verbs? You know, that'd right. be the subject. You look at Paul in Romans 3. I mean, who's the subject here? Right. Um, apart from the law. So, that's not the subject. <laughs> yep. <laughs> X that out. Yeah. And notice it's all present tense. Now. 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 Oh, have sinned. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's present tense. Yeah. Now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed. Mm. Now, it's been attested to by the law and the prophets. All who believe. There is no distinction. All have sinned and fall short. There is now they are justified by his grace as a gift. What's past tense is the sins previously committed. Exactly. Hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Because of the continual ongoing justification of the one who has faith in Jesus. By God. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Troubling. Troubling. <laughs> yeah, because where are you? Forgiven. Receiving. <laughs> yeah, you're the direct object. You receive the verbs. Yeah, and, and that, that something agitates us. One of the, one of the uh, uh, traditions, I guess, of the congregation that I'm in is that is the mother church, right? For a lot of churches in the area, sure. So there's two stained glass windows at the front. One is the good shepherd, beautiful, right? Mm-hmm. Sheep on the shepherd's shoulders, that kind of thing. The right. other one is, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Mm, yes, and so delicious. that window, that's from Revelation, right? Mm-hmm. And that window, actually, both those windows. The the feature of all the daughter congregations is that they all have the same windows. Hmm. at the front so every yeah. one of those congregations has jesus at the door standing and knocking which begs the question then right who um, opens it yeah who opens the door and i always joke about it and i don't think people find it as humorous as i do <laughs> uh, that's okay you know it's that he knocks uh like more with uh you know like with the swat team with the uh, yeah right with the battering ram <laughs> it's like like uh, yeah you're trying fu- to bar the door from me coming in that good last luck with scene that. in blues brothers when the swat team come through the windows <laughs> yeah yeah exactly it's like you know good luck you know, if, if I choose you, uh, it doesn't mm-hmm. matter if the door's shut or not. Well, and notice, Jesus just walks through the door into the upper room and uh-huh. says, Shalom. Yeah. Which, so the same yeah. John who says, I, you know, I will, Jesus, in mm-hmm. Jesus' words, I will draw all to me, also right. has this picture of Jesus knocking at the door. Mm-hmm. Like, okay, now how do I understand that expression? Right. Why, why does he even bother knocking? Right. For the same reason he says, Adam, where are you? Uh Uh-huh, yeah. It's all grace. Yeah, yeah. So we recognize, oh, he's out there. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Oops. Wait, he's not in here with me. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. And here I thought the whole time. Mm. I was watching a documentary about Jesus. I thought I had him. So let's wrap this up. Yep. Therefore, it's only the last model, that of the stadium open to all for free, free for nothing, filled with literally everybody in all of history that does justice to the mystery of the incarnation. Now, at this point, some of you listening may say, aha, Capon's a universalist. He doesn't believe in judgment. He believes you're all saved regardless of whether you believe or not. Nowhere does he say that. Mm -mm. Notice he emphasizes Romans chapter three, which is about faith. Yeah, free, free for nothing, filled with literally everybody in all history. Then (laughs) there is justice to the mystery of the incarnation. In other words, trust. 
Right. It's got to be trust. So as he himself has said to correct this opinion, I think you can find this on Mockingbird. It's an interview. He says, I believe in universal salvation, but I'm not a universalist. Mm -hmm. And I would argue that if you're Orthodox and a Christian, you would confess the same. Well, you do. Universal objective justification is the technical right. term. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And the subjective aspect comes through faith. Right. Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. True. Am I saved through faith in Christ? Yes, true. Again, both statements can be true simultaneously. They're not exclusive to one another. Well, like we talked about, I can't remember which episode, talking about faith. Is it the faith of Christ? Yes. Right. Is it your faith? Yes. Yes, exactly. Is it your possession? Sure it is. Is it your work? No, it's his. Right. Insofar as he is both the giver and the gift, the one mm -hmm. who gives you faith and faith. Mm -hmm. To say faith is to say Jesus. So when Jesus says to the man he heals, your faith has made you well, go. He's saying your Jesus has made you well. Right. So you could say my faith, it's the same as saying my Jesus. Right. My Jesus saved me. Oh, that's right. Good. I think what ends up happening is we want to divide that into two different things altogether, mm. individuate them mm -hmm. versus no. Apart from Christ, there is no faith, but apart from faith, you can't talk about Christ. Well, there, I, I think this happens, practically speaking, where, like we were saying, we want to be, you know, the, the judger of works. Right. Uh, even, even mathematics again. Right, yeah, or, mathematics. And we say, well, if there's no joy, no praise, no thanksgiving in the congregation, then there's no faith. Um, not necessarily. Right. But where there is faith, there will be joy and, and mm -hmm. thanks and praise. Right. I guess the, the challenge is, what does that actually end up looking like? Again, there we go. We, we want to categorize it. We mm -hmm. want to add it up and quantify it. Quantify, qualify, right. yeah. So back to the book. It says that we don't have to remember Jesus or even think about Jesus in order for the job done by the word of God in Christ to be effective in us. Mm. Boom mm. goes the dynamite. <laughs> Ouch. Let's read that one again. It says that we don't have to remember Jesus or even think about Jesus in order for the job done by the word of God in Christ to be effective in us. And it says that the job really is done. This is why your pastor's faith doesn't make the Lord's Supper the Lord's Supper. Mm -hmm. And your faith doesn't either. Mm -hmm. And yet it's your faith that grasps the Lord's Supper as the body and blood of Jesus under the bread and wine. Again, not one or the other, but both at the same time. That's the joy of of the resurrection. Mm -hmm. That's the joy of the sacrament. Received as gift. Yes. And including the faith to receive it as gift. Right. Mm -hmm. It makes it clear, in short, that we are all at the same game already, complete with free beer, banners, and hot dogs, and that we've been there from before the foundation of the world. Again, to note, the most used analogy for the resurrection and heaven is a wedding party. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what kind of wedding party you listeners have attended. But wedding parties in my family usually end with the police showing up. <laughs> they get a little out of control. A little out of hand. But the point being is Jesus starts his ministry by creating wine at a wedding and ends his ministry by serving wine at the mm -hmm. Last Supper. Mm -hmm. So for all you teetotalers out there, you're going to be really disappointed at the resurrection because it's a party. So the problem here isn't that the, that the game has already been won, that the whole job's been done. The mm -hmm. problem is we just don't believe it. Right, exactly. We sit in the curb and pout. Because the party's going on without us, and we simply refuse to put on the wedding garments. Back to the prodigal, that's the older son, right? Yes, exactly. It's like, well, he's not going to let me into the party. Put on the clothing he gave you for free. I don't want I want to wear my clothes. Your clothes are rags, filthy rags. Well, but I like them. All you hmm. got to do is change your clothes, and you can come to the party. Yeah, I've had clothes for you the whole time. Right. Ah, uh, silly rabbit. <laughs> Furthermore, it says plainly that the only appropriate thing to do, or did I skip a line there? I'm delirious of with the joy. Yep. Yeah, I'm delirious with this. So, we're all at the game already, complete with free beer, banners, and hot dogs, and that's what we've been there from before the foundation of the world. We've been there from the foundation of the world. Therefore, it says not only that we don't need to have the wherewithal, good works, for a ticket but that even to think we could buy a ticket is to misunderstand the whole setup. Furthermore, it says plainly that the only appropriate thing to do about such a fantastic arrangement is just shut up, believe it, and enjoy it because we've already got it. And finally, it says that the only judgment issued in the whole process is one of approval and inclusion, 
not one of condemnation. Hmm. Again, as as one of my, one of my favorite theologians says, if you want to go to hell, God won't stop you, but you got to climb over the body of Jesus to get there. Yeah, that's true. That's true. You actually have to work at it. You you really do. That's that is the for me as a pastor, especially when I see someone run away from the gospel and the and the gifts. That to me is the truly heartbreaking thing about that is it's, to say you're running into hell and you're glad about it. And well, but that you you have to make the effort. And you yeah, exactly. You have to be such a spiritual athlete to get there. Like whatever it is, whatever you tell yourself, every time you know the gifts are there for you to, right. to neglect that. Um you know, I we were talking about shame and guilt. I mm -hmm. don't know. Was it in this context? I can't remember. And uh you know, I, I just made a comment the other day saying, you know, like if you miss church for a few weeks, you just stop going, you know, for whatever reason, or you're right. out of town or something like that. You know, there's good shame where you say, you know, I really miss the gifts. Right. Like, you know, I haven't had the sacrament or whatever it is. Or, mm -hmm. You know, I need I need to hear that word of forgiveness again in my ears. Um, you know, and it and is it motivating? I suppose it is. I mean, it's faith speaking, right? 100%. Yeah. And, but to, to ignore that word it, it really takes some effort right. to say, I, you know what? I know I want it or I need it, but uh, I just, I'm just not going to do it. Right. I'm, I'm meh. <laughs> yeah. Either apathy or, or, or just actually there's this other thing that's actually is more important to me. Right. Like, Priorities. And Priorities. To, set, to set a priority. I don't know. Maybe it's just because I've lived with God's word, you know, in front of me, you mm -hmm. know, professionally and then, you know, personally right. too, for so much of my life that I just can't imagine any other way right now. Um, so well, maybe I'm naive. I don't know. From the other side of the street as a former atheist, when you recognize after the fact that if you had died, mm. you'd be in hell. And the, the, the great gift that your creator has given to you by simply allowing you to live long enough to be baptized and come to faith. My urgency for the gospel and, and therefore often my <laughs> aggressive... <laughs> approach to preaching the gospel for anybody Dogged. who's watched my videos or been in, in my presence when I've lectured. Uh -huh. I cannot stand people who want to skimp on the gospel then. Or I should say, I can't stand the behavior and the word of preachers who want to skimp on the gospel because I'm sitting there from the other side saying, do you not understand the consequences of not preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ? Yeah, it's not just mere neglect. Right. And again, I'm not saying, oh, well, I preach the gospel better or I know the gospel better because of X, Y, and Z. Mm. No, I'm just saying I come from a different perspective. I'm just different in that perspective. And from the perspective of a former atheist, give me the goods yeah. because I remember what that was like. And I don't want to, I know what I'm capable of as a sinner. And therefore, I don't want to be set free to mm -hmm. just do whatever comes natural. Or even to pursue, you know, other kinds of spiritualities. A hundred percent. Yeah. Exactly. Because they're, they're just unfulfilling in the end. Yes, exactly. Mm. Exactly. So back to the book, the only appropriate thing to do about such a fantastic arrangement is just shut up, believe it, enjoy it, because we've already got it. And finally, it says that the only judgment issued in the whole process is one of approval and inclusion, not one of condemnation. Now, if... Of course, we choose to sit there in the stadium and not believe we are there if we want to believe we are condemned when all the while, quote, unquote, there is therefore now no condemnation, we are free to do so. That's the point. But all that will do for us is ruin our own enjoyment of the game. Or possibly if we take Jesus's parables of judgment seriously, get us kicked out of the stadium altogether. But that's another subject commonly called hell. <laughs> for the moment, why don't you tell me what you think of all this so far? Isn't that something? Which is, I yeah, mean, I th which is also a beautiful place for us to end the podcast because then our listeners can answer the question. <laughs> well, right, and you think about well, like, what's the primary thing that I hear about week in week out in my church? Right, right. And uh, I imagine for some, there's a lot of condemnation, a lot of Sin, accusation, judgment, hell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and that. Is that preliminary? Yeah, it is. But I, I like uh, Capen's approach here. It's like, if you really want to talk about how we can do that, mm -hmm. but uh, let's talk about the, you know, free grace in Christ. Right. Exactly. Hmm. Oh, that's wonderful. Beautiful. I just want to keep reading this chapter. It's so good. But we can't because we're at the end of our time. <laughs> Indeed. 
So thank you once again for your time and attention. Thank you for giving it to us. And if you want to answer the question, why don't you tell me what you think of all this so far, uh, whether this episode or just the podcast in general, we'd love to hear your feedback. We're always looking to improve and get better at what we do Mm -hmm. because the gospel is free and we don't have to do good works, but this podcast is not, and uh, we want to do better for you. Yeah. So as always, thank you, and we'll see you next week for a brand new podcast. Peace.